thank you so much, Steve, for having me here. Uh, I'm sorry for all this paraphernalia. I know people typically leave Jackson Hole with crutches. They don't arrive with them, but I, I like to do things differently. Um, in any case, I'd like to um, uh, talk with you this morning about um, some of what I think are the most important. Can you all hear me? Okay. Lessons and legacies of Bretton Woods. Uh, I want to put, put our discussion in, um, early on in an international framework. Bretton Woods is a story I decided I wanted to try to tell in book form back in 2009 as the financial crisis was spreading globally. And you had world leaders from French President Nicolas Sarkozy to British Prime Minister Gordon Brown all calling for, quote unquote, a new Bretton Woods. Um, so I thought it might be a good idea to take a look at the old original one and it turned out to be a far more fascinating story than I had uh, ever realized. Let me do a little scene setting for you. The um, uh, Bretton Woods uh, International Monetary Conference. Oh, let's see if I can get this working here. Which button, guys? Oh, try this one. Yep. So this is the arrow to go. Oh, great. Okay. There we go. Uh, the Bretton Woods International Monetary Conference of 1944 is the most important international gathering since the Paris Peace Talks of 1919. Uh, there are over 700 delegates from uh, 44 allied nations. Uh, they start their deliberations just uh, three weeks after the D-Day landings at Normandy. So there's a real sense of cautious optimism in the air, uh, the belief that their deliberations hold real meaning. Um, uh, FDR uh, believed that the uh, event had enormous political significance. Uh, he believed that it would send a message to the enemy access, po access powers, that it was the Allies and of course the United States in particular that had the compelling vision for the post-war world. He actually believed that this could serve to bring the war to an earlier conclusion. Um, he was not too uh, interested in international monetary affairs. In fact, if you go back to the so-called London Economic Conference in 1933, he was actually a, an enemy of international monetary coordination, referred to it as uh, fetishes, of, uh, uh, um, uh, fetishes of private bankers. Uh, but um, in terms of the economic details of the conference, uh, he left those uh, uh, to one man in particular, his Treasury Secretary, Henry Morgenthau. Morgenthau perhaps knew less about e economics than uh, even uh, FDR. Um, he described himself as an apple farmer. He certainly had no background in economics um, uh, or, or monetary affairs. Uh, his only qualification for the position was that he was an old friend of FDR's from Hyde Park. So he, in return, was um, dependent on one man in particular, um, his uh, deputy, Harry Dexter White, who had no official title of significance within the Treasury until after Bretton Woods, and Morgenthau needed him to push this through Congress. Harry Dexter White is perhaps one of the most fascinating American political figures of the 20th century that nobody knows anything about. I'll have a bit more to say about him um, uh, momentarily. But these two men can broadly be described as economic determinists. They had a very specific story about how we came to Bretton Woods. Uh, they believed that it was the currency and trade wars of the early 1930s that were kicked off by Britain uh, exiting the gold exchange standard in 1931 that spread the Great Depression globally and created the environment of misery and anger that paved the path to aggression for Hitler and Mussolini. So they were determined to stamp out uh, economic um, uh, uh, aggression, as they put it, um, through the establishment of a new multilateral uh, uh, currency system uh, based on the U.S. dollar, which would stop competitive uh, devaluations. Uh, but they also had another agenda, which was um, uh, largely unstated, certainly not at the conference, um, but at least equally important. Uh, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill famously described American Lend-Lease Aid during World War II as, quote unquote, the most unsorted act. But he was painfully aware that at that aid uh, uh, came with geopolitical conditions that were very, very difficult for Britain um, uh, to meet. And these conditions were established by the U.S. Treasury. Um, Harry Dexter White, uh, uh, in particular, 
um, uh, who can very much be de described as uh, anti-imperialist, certainly um, uh, uh, in many ways um, anti-British. He was a man who was obsessed with Britain. Um, and that's because he had other interests in world affairs, which I'll discuss momentarily. But there were three demands made of the uh, British in return for uh, Lend-Lease aid. First, that after the war, Britain would um, uh, abandon imperial trade preference. This was the arrangement by which Britain gave itself privileged access to the markets and, uh, of its colonies and dominions. Second, they would once again make the pound sterling fully convertible into US dollars at a fixed and very overvalued exchange rate. Uh, as of a certain date, that became uh, July 15th, 1947, a day that will live in infamy for Britain because it officially marked their bankruptcy. In fact, you can see the empire collapsing um, over just three weeks in February of 1947 as Britain is rapidly running out of um, uh, gold and dollars and can no longer afford to maintain its responsibilities in places like Greece, Palestine, Burma, and uh, uh, India. And third, uh, Britain would be compelled at Bretton Woods to accept the new international monetary system with the US dollar as the global unit of um, uh, account. Now these two aims really came together at Bretton Woods and you, you, can, you can see them in the way Harry Dexter White um, uh, tutored the American delegation before they went into um, negotiations at Bretton Woods. Many of these um, uh, delegates were politicians uh, congressmen that were appointed by um, uh, FDR and Morgenthau, they were uh, untutored in monetary affairs. And this is what White tells them. He says, gold in Fort Knox is why the U.S. is, quote unquote, in such a powerful position at this conference. It is why we dominate the financial world. If only England was in this position, it would be a very different story. This is a man who is absolutely obsessed with the Rel relative um, uh, economic and geopolitical positions of the United States and Britain. And he is from the, his earliest time at Treasury. He comes to Treasury in uh, 1934. He's no more than a bureaucratic temp. But in 1936, I found this uh, remarkable memo um, uh, in his files. Again, he's nobody of consequence at this point. Um, where um, he's already planning an international monetary conference at which he, Harry Dexter White, is going to best the British. He writes, the more sterling countries there are in the world, the, the stronger will be England's position around a conference table should an international conference take place. But he's already planning Br uh, Bretton Woods eight years before it occurs, and the primary uh, uh, event, as it were, will be this um, uh, a battle with the um, uh, British. Here's how Morgenthau explained to President Truman um, after FDR uh, dies in 1945 what it was he set out uh, to do at Bretton Woods. He says, quote unquote, I wanted to move the financial center of the world from London and Wall Street to the United States Treasury. Notice the and Wall Street part. Um, this is very much an anti-banker um, uh, uh, agenda as well as a geopolitical uh, agenda. Um, why did the uh, British uh, ultimately uh, accept um, uh, the, the terms of this deal? Well, as a um, uh, British delegate, a uh, great economist in his own right, um, uh, Lionel Robbins, uh, who you see on the left, put it at Bretton Woods, and I'm quoting him, we needed the cash. Um, let me say a bit about the two main personalities at the conference. They are re remarkable figures. Um, the head of the British delegation, your favorite, uh, uh, John Maynard Keynes. Uh, Keynes, not just the most famous uh, economist of the 20th century, but one of the great um, uh, public intellectuals. Keynes at Bretton Woods really created the role of uh, the international celebrity economist. Uh, today, we're used to figures like um, Paul Krugman and Nouriel Roubini jetting around the world with the media waiting on their every word. But this was a role created by Keynes at Bretton Woods, and the Americans bitterly resented it. Bretton Woods was a huge media event, and the media were utterly fascinated with everything that Keynes had to say. So much so that Morgenthau refused even to allow Keynes to nominate him, Henry Morgenthau, to be president of the conference on the first day because he did not want Keynes getting anywhere near the podium. Um, Keynes uh, knew very well the game that the Americans um, were playing. Here's how he described to his government what was going on. Uh, he warned the British government of the need to guard 
against, I'm quoting him now, against the present emergency being used as an opportunity for picking out the eyes of the British Empire. Britain's going bankrupt rapidly during World War II and it's very dependent on American aid. He says, we need to quote unquote, prevent Britain becoming a satellite of the United States. He said, but there were quarters in the United States intending to use the grant of post-war credits to us as an opportunity for opposing upon the world the American conception of the international economic system. Uh, but despite the fact that he was a, a perspicacious uh, diplomat. He certainly understood what was going on. He was in many senses the world's worst diplomat. He was completely um, temperamentally unsuited to the role. He was far more interested in logically cornering and humiliating his opponents than he was with converting them. And even more importantly, I think he had one defect that uh, a diplomat should never have. He had a personal vested interest in the outcomes of these discussions. He wanted to be known as the, the man who overthrew the hated gold standard and replaced it with a new rational managed international monetary system. He knew very well that initially the dis system would be white's and not his, but he believed that the world would eventually see sense and adopt um, his system. Um, his bust ups with Harry Dexter White uh, in the two, year of, two years of negotiations that led up to the conference were absolutely legendary. Uh, these two were very uh, different characters, um, uh, temperamentally and by background. Keynes was uh, uh, the son of upper class, um, upper middle class, uh, Cambridge academics. He was raised by a governess and servants. He was expected to go on to great things. Harry Dexter White was the youngest of seven. Uh, children of Lithuanian um, uh, Jewish immigrants bo born in working class uh, uh, Boston. Um, his fa parents died when he was very young. He dropped out of sc school in his first attempt to get a degree in order to go back to his uh, family's hardware business. So they came from uh, very different backgrounds. Um, this is what uh, Keynes had to say about um, uh, White's uh, plans for Bretton Woods when he first uh, saw the, the draft in 1942. Um, he described it as, quote unquote, the work of a lunatic or some sort of bad joke. My favorite bust up between the two is in October of 1943. Keynes takes the new draft from White, throws it on the floor and yells, this is intolerable. It is yet another Talmud. Talmud, of course, being a, a reference to um, uh, uh, White being uh, Jewish, to which White responded, well, we will try to produce something which your highness can understand. Um, these two men had very, very different visions um, uh, at Bretton Woods. It was the American vision, of course, that won out because the Americans had the money. Um, the Americans controlled about two-thirds of world monetary gold reserves at the time. But uh, here is what they were looking for. Um, White wanted to establish a new international monetary system based on the U.S. dollar. And he used remarkable ruses at Bretton Woods that Keynes... Um, uh, Keynes had fought bitterly against this, to have the U.S. dollar declared not just as good as gold, um, but a surrogate for it. In fact, the only legal surrogate for gold um, in the entire world. Um, Keynes bitterly resisted this. Um, he wanted to create a new supranational currency, which would be called the Bancor, which would ultimately supplant the international role of the U.S. dollar. White wanted to create a strong institution to oversee these new arrangements and a powerful new international monetary fund that would have significant control over countries' monetary policies. They would have the, the right to uh, veto devaluations, for example. Uh, why were the Americans willing to support such a thing? Because they were the only country with veto power, so it could never be used against the United States. Uh, Keynes viewed the IMF more as an ATM. Uh, countries that were uh, debtors could uh, go to the ATM and withdraw cash with uh, minimal conditions. He didn't want it to be a, a powerful body with its, with its own uh, consciousness. Uh, one of the most um, uh, important and interesting uh, decisions that was not taken at the conference was who would lead the institution. Um, and, and that, I think, is one of the most interesting stories in my book. Let me talk about it briefly. In January of 1946, President Truman nominates Harry Dexter White to be the first U.S. executive director of the fund, and he's going to nominate him uh, to be the um, uh, first managing director of the IMF, the head of the IMF. Uh, 
But when FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover gets wind of this, he prepares a long memorandum for the president arguing, don't even think about it. I can prove that this man, Harry Dexter White, is in fact a Soviet spy. Spoiler alert for those of you who haven't read my book yet, he was. Um, a truly remarkable story. Uh, Truman did not trust Hoover, but he knew he had a political problem on his hands. Um, he tried to withdraw the nomination, uh, the executive director nomination, but it had already gone through a nominating committee. He argued to his treasury secretary and secretary of state who wanted White out of government entirely that he could effectively quarantine White at the IMF so it wouldn't be a problem. Uh, but he couldn't appoint another American to sit above White because that would raise all sorts of questions as to why the architect of the architect of the fund was being passed over. So the Americans concocted a new narrative that they took to the British in March of 1946, just before the Savannah Conference to inaugurate the IMF, where the Americans explained that after due consideration, they decided they wanted to have presidency of the World Bank, and it would be ungracious of the Americans to take both institutions. Now, the Americans were never gracious throughout any of these discussions, so this was a rather remarkable concession. So the only reason why a European still heads the IMF today is because of President Truman's efforts to cover up the white spy scandal. Um, uh, let's uh, sort of bring things uh, slowly up to, uh, to the present day. Um, was Bretton Woods actually a success? That's a strange question to many people because the 25-year period from uh, 1946 to 1971, which is normally called the Bretton Woods uh, era, was an era of tremendous economic uh, recovery around the world. But this had a little, I would argue, nothing to do with Bretton Woods. Um, the uh, newly established IMF was virtually moribund throughout the rest of the 1940s and uh, most of the 1950s. It was mothballed by the Truman administration. Its role was effectively replaced by the um, uh, Marshall Plan from 48 to um, 52 and outgrowths of the Marshall Plan that were really actually part of the initial Marshall Plan negotiations with the Europeans, such as the creation of the Euro European, and European Payments Unit Union in uh, uh, 1950, and that lasted until 1958. In fact, it wasn't until 1961 that the first nine European countries met the requirements of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the uh, convertibility requirements of the IMF's article of, uh, uh, Articles of Agreement. So the monetary system founded at Bretton Woods really can't be said to have started until about 1961 by which point it was already breaking down as the U.S. was losing uh, uh, gold reserves. And as we all know from uh, uh, the introduction, Nixon closed the uh, gold window in 1971, making the um, uh, dollar inconvertible into gold. Well, let's take things up to the present day. Um, at Bretton Woods, the United States was the world's uh, largest international creditor, and Britain was the world's largest international debtor. If we were to have a new Bretton Woods, we would need a similar deal between the world's largest international creditor and debitor, uh, debtor, uh, but they're quite different characters. The world's largest international creditor today is, of course, China. The world's largest international debtor is the United States. And it's not surprising that the position of the United States is almost identical today to what Keynes and the British advocated in the 1940s. For example, many of you re may remember that back in uh, 2010, then Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner uh, made a proposal to put caps on persistent current account surpluses. These were precisely the ideas that the, the, the uh, uh, British and Keynes brought to the table at Bretton Woods in 1944, in which the uh, Americans re rejected um, uh, outright. And let's talk a bit about the, the Fed, which is why, of course, um, you're all here. And I want to talk uh, the, about the importance of the role of the Fed. And I, I'm going to start by il illustrating it um, with one country that's been uh, much in the news lately, um, Ukraine. Uh, back in April of 2013, the Yanukovych government in Ukraine walked out of discussions with the IMF over a $15 billion financial assistance package. Um, the uh, biggest item of contention uh, still is, it was the elimination of energy subsidies. Yanukovych decided he didn't want to do this. Um, he was going to continue muddling through, so he um, successfully issues a $1.25 billion 10-year um, a euro bond um, uh, yielding seven and a half percent. 
everything's going all along swimmingly until May of 2013, May 22nd to be uh, uh, exact, when Ben Bernanke makes his famous taper comment. Many of you may remember that this was a very carefully hedged comment. Uh, uh, Bernanke said that the Federal Reserve may, at some point in the near future, begin to pare back or taper its um, uh, monthly uh, asset purchases if economic conditions so warrant. Uh, the reaction in uh, emerging market bond markets was utterly savage, and the country that was hit hardest was Ukraine. It saw the yield on its 10-year uh, bond soar to over 11%, uh, a level at which it stayed for most of the rest of the year. Um, at that level, Yanukovych could no longer afford to uh, roll over Ukraine's debt. As we know, he was forced into a bailout negotiation with Moscow. Um, and you can see in December, uh, after that bailout agreement is, is reached, Yanukovych agrees to abandon the, the um, association agreement with the um, European Union. Um, the uh, yield on Ukrainian bonds briefly comes back down, but then soars again as Ukrainians take to the streets, and the rest, of course, is history. Now, if you remember, the, the Fed did not actually begin the taper until January of 2014. So it is not uh, unreasonable speculation to suggest that if uh, uh, Bernanke and the Fed had remained dovish for another six months, the Yanukovych government might actually have survived and we would have a different uh, situation in um, uh, Ukraine. Just to emphasize the uh, enormous geopolitical power um, uh, of the uh, uh, Federal Reserve. And what about the situation today? Uh, um, uh, there's much speculation about what the reaction in emerging markets uh, might be um, if the Fed should uh, begin to raise rates earlier or more aggressively than um, the world is expecting. Well, let's first look at what happened in um, uh, 2013 after Bernanke's taper comments. Um, the countries that suffered the most in, in terms of seeing yields rise on their sovereign bonds were countries with very large current account deficits. These were countries that were dependent on the import of short-term capital, which was being facilitated by the Fed's monthly asset purchases. Uh, these countries are in particular um, uh, Ukraine, Turkey, uh, South Africa, uh, Brazil, per, uh, Peru, um, uh, Mexico. Uh, what's interesting is that if you look at uh, the situation of these countries today, it's really not much better. Their current accounts have not in fact, improved very much uh, at all. The one uh, that has improved the most is, in fact, Ukraine. Its current account deficit is down from 9% to about 2.5%, but that is still very high uh, by emerging market standards. So these countries are still very, very vulnerable this time around. Um, so what, what could we do uh, about um, uh, this uh, situation to prevent uh, uh, emerging market turmoil from uh, Federal Reserve um, uh, decision? Well, I mean, there, there are, uh, are two ways that have been proposed. Uh, first, um, uh, central bankers in uh, emerging markets have suggested the Fed needs to be a lot more cooperative and helpful um, in these uh, situations. Um, it should provide early warning, uh, which presumes that the Fed knows what it's going to do, and often it doesn't know what it's going to do until the FOMC meetings. It should provide currency swapped uh, uh, arrangements. If you actually go back through the transcripts of the FOMC meetings, you'll find that there's no hope for this. Um, in October of 2008, there are fascinating FOMC trans transcripts in which the members are debating um, extending central bank swap lines to emerging markets. Um, they are very aware at the time that the financial crisis is spreading globally, but they're not actually focused on stopping the global spread. They are concerned with one thing, blow back into the United States. Uh, Board of Governors member uh, Don Cohn, for example, said a number of these countries, for example, have very high holdings of U.S. agency securities, Freddie, Freddie Mac and, and Fannie Mae primarily. And if they lack an easier access to dollars, they might be um, uh, forced to uh, sell these securities uh, en masse 
to raise dollars. Uh, this would push up mortgage rates in the United States. We need to prevent this. So only four emerging market countries uh, uh, were considered worthy of this support because of the damage that they could cause the U.S. economy. Uh, those were Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, and um, uh, Singapore. So emerging markets would be crazy uh, to depend on assistance from uh, the Fed this time around. What about emerging markets themselves? Could they do anything to protect themselves? And in fact, they can. There was a fascinating study uh, published in November of 2013 by the IMF. They looked at the uh, emerging market countries that had weathered the period of non-conventional monetary policy in the United States best, and they concluded that these countries had in particular three primary characteristics. One, they had a relatively low level of foreign ownership of domestic assets. Two, they were running large current account surpluses. And three, they had large current, uh, foreign exchange reserves. Now, this translates directly into a policy agenda. Um, emerging market governments should, in good times, apply a firm hand to keep their imports and their currency down and their exports and foreign exchange reserves up. The big problem is this is the definition of currency manipulation in the United States. And in fact, we're seeing a political reaction to this now. As you know, there's enormous pressure from US um, uh, exporters for the United States to um, uh, Im impose anti-currency manipulation provisions in all future uh, trade agreements. And this, I believe, is at the uh, heart of the uh, problem in the um, international uh, monetary system dominated as it is by a fiat, do fiat dollar. What we consider to be mercantilism and currency war uh, initiated uh, uh, by others are considered by those others with support from the International Monetary Fund to be nothing more than prudence. Uh, now, given the importance of the uh, US dollar, the foundational importance in the multilateral trading system, I think we should be enormously concerned about the pot potential for uh, protectionist pressures to emerge from this uh, conflict. What do I mean by this? Well, countries are willing to engage in non-discrimination in trade and run current account surpluses. That is to export more than they receive in compensation in imports only to the extent that the currency that they receive um, in compensation, which in this case is generally the US dollar, is uh, believed to be capable of holding its global purchasing power over time. If that should break down, and it may break down, uh, China, for example, has signed a bilateral agreement with Japan, Turkey, Brazil, Russia to begin trading without the US dollar as an intermediating vehicle. What I believe you'll see is countries beginning to engage in trade discrimination, that is managing their bilateral trade arrangements in order to keep them all in balance, in order to avoid accumulating each other's currencies, which they don't trust. And that, I believe, uh, serves to emphasize the importance of our discussions here today. Thank you very much.